Hi, I'm James Ede of the Ede Foundation, but you can call me Jim. The Ede Foundation is dedicated to building communities through chess. And if you're part of a community, you're never alone. So the Ede Foundation also supports chess excellence and chess literacy. Literacy by literacy, I mean the ability to read and write chess notation. So that then you can look at magazines and books and just ex and train yourself to be a better chess player if that's what you want. But the Ede Foundation is dedicated to the community. And if you can access the community already, then you can play anyone, anywhere, at any time. But if you have trouble forming, accessing the, the chess community through the internet or whatever, the Ede Foundation can help you build the community wherever you are, whatever language you speak, whatever country you're from. It just doesn't matter. Now, the Ede Foundation also has a sponsor, which I want to share the screen for the um, a uh, dollar store that is one of our sponsors now. And um, I think that uh, I want to emphasize that the dollar store gives you quality products at inexpensive prices. And you can see that there's all sorts of categories that you can buy. And when you buy using the discount code CHESS, you will be surprised at um, what you can, how inexpensively you can buy quality products. And you will also benefit the Eat Foundation. And you will connect the business community with the chess community. And this is what I want to encourage everyone to do. Um, this is something that we can all benefit from. And you can see that I am telling you about my YouTube channel. It's scrolling across the bottom of the screen. Please subscribe. I definitely want you to do that. Um, but also, I'm going to leave this on the bottom of the screen scrolling along so that you can see that um, you can get to this URL, use the discount code CHESS, and you'll support both the business and the chess communities. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. And now I want to get back to business here, which is the chess files. The answers are out there. And today's question is how do you win the Arthur Award for Chess Excellence? The foundation gives this out annually. And I have as a guest, a special guest, uh, uh, Alexi Root professor at um, UT Dallas, who has won by submitting the best essay, and there were great essays, a tremendous competition, it's very difficult to choose, and um, but she did produce the best essay, essay. And I want to show you a picture of her. It's, uh, oh, that, that's my producer, stop it, stop it, stop it. This is, this is the professor at UT Dallas, and Dr. Root has been generous enough of, with her time to uh, join us today. And so I will, if my producer will cooperate, uh, there she is. Hello, Alexi. Hi. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining me on the, today's show. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. You're, you're so welcome. Um, but Alexi, the reason, the special reason that I have you on today is to talk about um, why did your essay win the Arthur Award? Well, that was up to you and your board of directors at the oh, e Foundation. True. So they would probably be more qualified to say why mine won, but I can tell you what I wrote about, which is my upcoming book, United States Women's Chess Champions, which will be published by McFarland in August of 2022. However, when I applied for the EAT Award, I didn't yet have a publisher. I was still at the early stages of the idea. And I think maybe what captured the imagination of you and your board of directors was the idea of the project, which is to profile the biographies and the games of the US women's chess champions. Yes, and can you count yourself among them? Yes, I was the 1989 US women's chess champion. And I wanna show off my pet rabbit okay. real quickly because that would explain why I moved. <laughs> there, there she is. He, there he is. He, he, uh, yeah. Yes, he is requesting by his stance that I come over here to pet him. So okay. hopefully hopefully for the rest of the interview, he'll just, uh, you know, be petted. Hey, welcome to live streaming, you know. Yeah, that's we'll, right. We'll go with yeah. the floor. Mm -hmm. We'll go with the flow. Yeah. Um, so, um, I, I should always back up and start with the correct interview process of asking you, um, where are you originally from? I am from Lincoln, Nebraska. I was Lincoln, born in Nebraska. Lincoln. Yeah. 
And now you live near UT Dallas? I um, yeah, I live in uh, North Texas and I work oh, for the okay. University of Texas at Dallas. Um, okay. And get my camera centered again. There we go. <laughs> I see you perfectly. <laughs> I, have to, I have to figure out which way left and yeah, right. Yeah, I know. It's a mirror. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm pointing I, to it right now, aren't I? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I would definitely do that. I would definitely do that. Um, yeah, I, I teach online for the University of Texas at Dallas, which this semester, 91% of the classes are online, but yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, back in the old days, uh, as in before the pandemic, my class was maybe one of about 7% of classes that were completely online. And so uh, I've been doing that teaching online for University of Texas at Dallas since 2001, when Dr. Tim Redman wow. and I, Dr. Tim Redman and I wrote a grant uh, which was funded at $50,000 level to develop online courses connecting chess and education. And because of that grant, both Tim Redman and I started teaching these courses and then he handed them over to me. So I'm teaching uh, both chess one and chess two uh, courses. He used to, he used to teach the chess two course. But that's almost, that's almost 20 years ago. It is. Yeah. So really we were like in the pioneers Trail of online blazing. teaching yeah. and um, it's been very enjoyable that when I started teaching in uh, 2001 online, I created this course uh, trying to show how chess and education are connected. And, you know, with it being asynchronous and online, I had to develop lectures that the students would read and I called them units. So I had unit one through unit eight. Those mm -hmm. units actually became my first book, Children in Chess, A Guide for Educators, which was published in 2006. Yeah. And um, so having turned my course into my first book, then I had to rewrite my course and I've subsequently written um, a total of seven books. And this upcoming one about the U.S. Women's Chess Champions, which I know we're going to talk more about, uh, will be my eighth book. And yeah. I'm also very honored to be a small part of a chapter about chess and education in Chess for Dummies. I think you were called the, the subject matter expert. In well, this. and then I'm very honored. Yes, I, yes. I, I, I didn't remember that exact phrasing, but yeah. thank you for including me in your book, which has sold probably, uh, I would guess, 10,000 times more than any of my books have sold. <laughs> but uh, it's really, I mean, it's, I believe, the best selling chess book or one of the top three best selling chess books of all time, correct? Yeah. You know? any, it's the best selling of any living author. That's what I can say with confidence. And, well, um, yeah, that's an amazing, uh, amazing record and well deserved. I, before I wrote my own books, which I now require my students to either buy or check out, I used Chess for Dummies as one of the texts in my courses. Now, you got bumped out nice. by my own books, but yes, I did yeah, use yeah, to well. use that. <laughs> I did use to use Chess for Dummies in my courses because many of my many of my students um, come to the class and they're. Uh, you know, I would say roughly 80% of my students, maybe even 85% are UT Dallas undergraduates who don't have a chess background. And so they're coming to the course and one of the first things they need to do is learn how to play chess. And so your yeah. book was really uh, foundational for that, of course. Um, I also have, on the other hand, UT Dallas students who are members of the UT Dallas chess team. Now they Which already know how to play darn chess. Darn good team, yeah. Right, they're international masters and grandmasters, and so when they join the course, that's just a a wonderful experience for me and for the other students in the course. And then I also have people uh, join the course from all over the world. I've had students as far away as Qatar join my course because they're interested in the subject matter. That is, that's outstanding because, you know, the whole idea uh, it, for the foundation is to make it a global enterprise um, because, you know, it, it's so wonderful now that we are connected. Um, we can play anyone, anywhere, at any time. And so it really doesn't matter what country you're from. It doesn't matter what language you speak because chess is a universal language. And I, I became aware of what you were doing um, very early on in the process um, because 
I, I actually met um, uh, Professor uh, Redmond, Dr. Tim Redmond, um, and I was uh, impressed by what he was doing at UT Dallas in terms of chess, allowing chess scholarships. Um, and it was amazing to me, the um, quality players that were attracted to UT Dallas um, from, well, you know better than I, but from just about all sorts of places. Right. You know, they, they didn't just come from Lincoln, Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I mean, Tim Redman is just a foundational, along with administration at UT Dallas needs credit too, because you can't yes. start something without the funding and support of the administration, which they have been supported. But UT Dallas is a Texas university without a football team, but we have right. a chess team and our chess team really carries the banner of the school as intellectual, smart, hardworking, they are our stars, and uh, absolutely, you, I believe you're on our advisory board still. Is that correct for the chess? Yes, team? I was the initial um, chairman of the chess advisory, so I got the chance to meet the provost and the president. And when Tim asked me to do that, I um, thought, okay, I got to sell this. Oh, I'd, it was already pre-sold. It was just an amazing job that he had done to prepare them to meet with me. Uh, so that all I had to do was say, you know, I'm Jim Eid. And that was it. They were, <laughs> they were behind it. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's it was amazing. the easiest interview I ever had. <laughs> the, the support the chess program has is, is, is tremendous. And it also credit not just to the administration and Tim Redman and the current director, Jim Stallings and coach Jim. Julio Zadora uh, and all the people who've been in the program, like Louis Salinas, Tim Salinas, Steiner, yes. Rodney Milovanovich. Oh, yeah. uh, Rodney not just all of too. those, but yeah. the students. The students maintain a very high GPA. So they're, yeah. they're living examples that top chess players are also top students so that any university, and many have copied the model, any university would want to recruit chess players as students because not only are they great chess players they're great students and ambassadors for the university and that's the whole that won't maybe not the whole but that's a main argument for why you should have chess at your university it's going to attract just the type of student you would want to have i agree completely and i can only say that when i was in college i could only dream of getting a scholarship for playing chess and it's a reality now oh it and absolutely is and it's life-changing yes. uh, two of the women that I have in my book, because they're U.S. women's champions, came to the United States because they had college chess scholarships. And they both were from University of Maryland, Baltimore County, which is also an excellent program. Great school. They, uh, but uh, Sabina Foyser and Nazi Pakitsky both came to the U.S. to play for the UMBC chess team. They are now in the U.S for the rest of their lives and they both became U.S. women's champions. So it's what the universities are doing along with the what the wonderful St. Louis Chess Club is doing is really changing the landscape of who our top players are. Yeah, uh, St. Louis is now the mecca of chess for the United States. Absolutely. When I was growing up, it was New York City, but now St. Louis is definitely where it's at. Um, it also has the Hall of Fame for um, the World Hall of Fame and the U.S. Hall of Fame, um, a wonderful chess club in the facility. Uh, there's a restaurant right next to it. I I'm just I was just going to spit out the name and I it blanked on it, but it was like King's something, uh, and uh, so it's it's got this chess connection. And so uh, we have to do a shout out for Rex Senkfold, who's um, just changed the lands landscape of the United States chess. And uh, so, uh, but I I have. Uh, always have a special fondness for UT Dallas. Um, and uh, you guys give out an Educator of the Year Award. Uh, so people from all over the country get to go to UT Dallas and have that experience and see firsthand what a magnificent job uh, both you, Tim, and all the other people you mentioned, Rodney, Jay, uh, Jim, is he Jim or Jay now? I um, there is a Jay Stallings from, I believe, California, who is yes. a chess coach. But Jim Stallings is a separate person who is yes. at UT Dallas. 
But hasn't he changed his name? Didn't he go by Jay for a little while? Because I, I don't think so. I think oh, he's always think been so? either okay. J- James or Jim, and then uh, Jay okay. Stallings is someone separate. Also a very well-known figure in the yes. chess community. And yeah. you were, of course, Chess Educator of the Year. Thank you for bringing that up. But, you know, this show is all about you, not me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or it could be about both. <laughs> anyway, either way is fine. <laughs> I mean, there's no. a nice Eid Foundation logo in your book. Yeah. <laughs> has to be uh, a little bit about you, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. But, you know, um, I, so that was my the first thing. And the other thing that I was um, connected with uh, UT Dallas, besides the Chess Advisory Board and the, the Educator of the Year, um, there is also this thing we called the Koltonowski Conference. Right. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Because that Absolutely. was an amazing thing. It is an amazing thing. And hopefully its next edition will be happening August of 2021 at the U.S. Open. I haven't really been in the loop about whether the U.S. Open's being held because of this pandemic. Right. Yeah. But traditionally and it is a tradition because it's happened twice in 2001 was the first Koltanowski conference organized by me and Tim Redmond mostly Tim Redmond and then once again in 2011 was a Koltanowski conference that uh, Tim Redmond and I organized at UT Dallas and um, it brought people from all over the world to uh, we had it I think each time at a hotel near UT Dallas and um, people would present about their research in chess and education and they'd make connections with each other, which right. it was really wonderful. Um, for example, I remember um, Joseph Aberhard came to a conference and what he needed was software to use with his students so that he could run a study. Because if you run a study where one person is a chess teacher in one class and a different person is a chess teacher in another class, who knows whether the right. the influence of the teacher, like a really gifted teacher, could influence it. So he wanted a software to kind of make everyone have the same chess experience. And so I introduced him to Steve Lipschultz of Think Like a King software. And so I made that connection just in a conference break room. And right. it went from there. Right. And Joseph Aberhard was able to finish his dissertation. So that's, that's, how things that's work. the kind of connection that happens right. at, at at these live conferences. So um, hopefully it will be a live conference. Hopefully it will happen, but I don't have any updates for you on that. Now there is a book, there is a book about the first conference, the 2001 conference. So if people are interested in it, uh, they can look for the book by Tim Redman about the first Koltanowski conference, which gives a sense of the types of papers that were presented there. Right. Right. Somebody I know had a hand in getting that published. I, Yes, I believe that you, I don't know if it was you personally or your, not, I don't think it was your foundation yet because the foundation hadn't started. So I believe you personally gave money to allow that book to be published. So thank you for that, because I think that that book, uh, which also used to be required for my courses until I bumped it out with my own books, uh, you know, that book (laughs) actually, that book actually made it made a difference to have all that chess research in one place and so well, tim is very that. persuasive you know and but he yes. he was very i think correct about that that it needed to be preserved right so that i agree other people, yeah and yeah. And, it, and it was a it was a good insight and i was happy to be a part of making it happen but the idea is to to inspire others to do more work in these fields well since my rabbit has left me from okay. being petted. I think I will see if I can grab that off the shelf because then I could show that to everyone if I have it if I have it handy, if I can spot it quickly. That's that's the challenge when you have a lot of books, yeah. right? Is yeah. can, can you can you spot yeah. it? So I will keep looking and I will okay. if, I, yeah. if it you, appears, I will I will uh I will show it to every oh, if wait, I was I the host, I would it. get I would go get mine. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, Mine's sorry. autographed. Oh, I have an okay. autograph copy. There it is. There it is. Yeah. This is the book that, the, nice cover. He got permission to use that. It was actually an advertising logo um, for a bank. But yeah. isn't it adorable? A pawn it with, or I think it's a pawn. Or maybe it's a king. 
Well, it's got yeah, a it's from, I mean, graduation yeah, it's got, cap It's got the graduation on. cap obscuring what type of, type of chessman it is, but there you go. So yeah. uh, that was the book that Your Money helped produce and that I, I believe it sold quite a few copies. People were interested in it and I still refer back to it. It's still a reference for me. Yes, and also yeah, I just wanted to mention that if the pandemic allows it, it will be in Cherry Hill, right. New Jersey this, this year. Mm -hmm. um, and I I have been pushing to have it renamed from the Koltanowski Conference to the Redmond Conference. Oh. But I'm, I'm not sure that it's going to be called that this year, but I hope so. Well, I, and I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, either way, I think is great because Tim wanted to honor George Koltanowski, who was a course. very important figure in U.S. chess. So... You know, one I, of the greatest I promoters think, of all time. Right. I think Tim would be happy either way. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I believe there there may or may not. I don't know what the status of the budget is with Jim Stallings and the chess director, but perhaps some of the money that you have in the past put in for uh, making books and, and supporting the conference might still be there to help the conference become an excellent event as the past two conferences were. So, yeah. but I, I'm not, I'm not sure what the status is, but thank you for supporting it. As I, that short story I shared from it indicates it was really a foundational event for many yes. people. And then we have the nice book from the first conference and from the second conference in 2011, I went ahead and posted um, PDFs of the talks uh, on the UT Dallas website. So people who are interested right. can still track those down. I have been able to, to reference them on so that I know that you're telling the truth. And uh, <laughs> Hopefully they're still there. I think the danger I is with, with websites, I, websites are yeah. constantly being redesigned. And yeah. I think that there's a chance that that page could just get cut and disappear. And that's what's really right. nice about your having funded a book from the first conference. So even if the second conference papers disappear off the internet at least we have the first conference book so thank you for that well you you know it was just a small part that i could play and the work of putting on a conference like that is was far more substantial so i want to thank you for the work that you did and of course the work that tim did um and i really um hope, think that one day it will be called the redmond conference and uh, because it was really I think his uh, idea and his uh, force of his personality that made it happen um, because he had to, he, he was very persuasive when he approached me about um, publishing a book about it. So, yeah, you know, I, I don't, I don't think I was, the, <laughs> I don't think I was the only one he persuaded to do something in, in terms of making that happen. But I do want to get back to the uh, current book projects yes. because you did, uh, the, the essay that you submitted to for a consideration for the Arthur Award um, was uh, very inspirational because I, I had a board member come back to me um, uh, saying that this is exactly what we want to do. This type of thing is to inspire people to excel at chess as well as just to, you know, because I think, and I've said this before, so pardon me if you've heard this before, um, but I think chess, if you give a, the gift of chess to a child, you give a gift that can last a lifetime. It's an educational tool when they're young. It's a pleasant pastime when they're old and it's a solace in our old age. We don't have to think about the next doctor's appointment or a hospital bill, or we play in a game of chess, we're transported into that universe of 64 squares. So it's a wonderful thing to give to a child, but we also want to help people to become, to advance the art of the game, to advance the science of the game, to become excellent at it. And that, to me, when I first started playing chess, um, that was what was inspirational to me to see something that I thought was in terms of beauty, a beautiful game and the stories that went along with it. So how did you get started in chess? Well, my dad taught me how to play when I was around mm -hmm. five years old and uh, he was not a tournament player. So he did not know, for example, the en passant rule. And uh, he let me win because that's sort of how I wanted things to be. So he let me win for four years, <laughs> <laughs> for four years from ages five to nine. And I guess uh, when I was nine years old, I said to him that I'd like him to play for real. 
And so he played for real. I defeated him and he found a local chess club to take me to, which was in Lincoln, Nebraska. So that's how that started for me. And I wanted to get back though, to what you're saying about, uh, this forthcoming book. So there have been 29 U.S. women's chess champions between 1937 and 2020, and there have been 60 U.S. women's chess championships. So you can tell the U.S. women's championship used to not be held every year. Now, thanks to St. Louis Chess Club, it is held every year. And you can also tell the fact there was 29 champions and 60 championships, there were people who won this championship multiple times. For example, Gisela Gresser won it nine times. Irina Kresh has now won it eight times. So when I'm working on this book, those champions are going to have longer chapters and more games. Of course. So what it's looking like right now, and I'm really in the midst of it, so it looks it looks like I'll have about 180 games, so roughly six games per champion. But someone like Arena Crush is going to have 21 games, all annotated, in her chapter. And someone right. like someone like me, who's a one-time champion, might only have three games in her chapter. Right. So that's how it's going to be divided up, so that the um, stronger players and the multiple-time champions get more games for people to look at. And what you said about being inspired by looking at games. These are not only fantastic games, but I have to let you in on a a wonderful thing that's happened. So there's a pandemic. Normally the UT Dallas chess team, the pandemic's not the wonderful thing. Let me me back up. But because of the pandemic, normally the UT Dallas chess team members volunteer in the community. They give simultaneous exhibitions. They direct tournaments. They're out in person. Well, they can't do that this semester. So I asked Jim Stallings, could they, as their community service, annotate games for this book? So he gave them a choice. He said, chess team members, you can either make videos teaching chess to children, which is great, and a lot of team members chose that, or you can annotate games for Dr. Alexi Root's book, which is going to reach a lot of people, hopefully, and... um, So seven team members chose that and they're required to spend 14 hours volunteering. So I got 98 hours of international masters, masters and grandmasters annotating games for this book, which when you say about inspiration, so every game is annotated and I've annotated some. I mean, because there's 180 games, they're doing, yeah. about, they're doing about 100. But for example, mm-hmm. Irina Crush's chapter uh, is annotated. All those games are annotated by one international master and one grandmaster. Because yeah, I wouldn't frankly, want to annotate them. Yeah. Well, frankly, yes. I, I mean, my mm-hmm. highest rating was 2260 U.S. chess rating, which is master. But Irina Crush's highest rating is over 2,500 U.S. chess. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I'm just really grateful to Jim Stallings and to the chess team members who are volunteering because I can say confidently that that these annotations are really going to be top notch. And so that this book and these games will be inspirational, not just to girls and women, but to anyone who takes the time to read through the games. And so it's, it's a heavily games focused book. Uh, There are, there is biographical information. There's introductions to the games. Like why is this game important? Who are the contestants in this game? But the heart of the book is these games. Well, you know, uh, I want to just emphasize that I, there was a 1995 tournament, the Pan Pacific out here in San, San Francisco, and I wrote the tournament book, but I got Nick, Grandmaster Nick DeFermian to annotate the games. There because, you go. You know, yeah, it's the same yeah. thing. So that's that's a wonderful service because uh, annotating a game is, is work. It it's absolutely not, is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, uh, there- good, good job. Well, I, I was very, I was very fortunate that that happened because, uh, I mean, to get that those ninety eight hours of work, uh, which you know, like it looks like they'll end up annotating just over a hundred games, so they're spending at least an hour per game, yeah. and that's that's phenomenal. Um, yeah. And of course, I I edit the annotations afterwards because as my publisher 
Robbie Franklin at McFarland says, you know, with so many people annotating, they're going to get carried away with variations, you know, because they it's find really something true. exciting and they'll be, get, they'll have a long variation. And so I am um, putting it back into terms that, uh, you know, the average chess reader can understand. So there, there's a lot of verbal explanations and not so much here's, you know, move, 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 move in notation. There's a lot of verbal explanation. So I'm, I, as you can tell, super excited about the annotated games. But one of the things that your Arthur Award, which I'm deeply grateful for, will help with is a lot of the early champions, their games are not easily accessible. And so yeah. there's an there's archive. Chess the, based databases. And they're not in, they're yeah. not in the databases, right? So right. There's archives in St. Louis. We talked about the World Chess Hall of Fame and the St. Louis Chess Club. There's archives there. And there's also archives at the Cleveland Public Library. So, uh, you know, I'm doing, yeah, I'm doing as much as I can by email, but uh, it's nice to have that award for, I've already got my first vaccine shot. Yay. Uh, my second one will be April 6th, and then I'll feel more confident to make travel arrangements as needed to track down these last, uh, important score sheets because my goal is for every u.s women's champion at least for the year she won to have a game yeah you know and surprisingly thus far and we can put a help notice out to all your viewers i haven't been able to find a game from the 1937 champion adele rivero from that tournament i found games of her playing in other tournaments but to me it seems foundational to track down a game that she played when she won the first ever U.S. Women's Chess Championship. Sorry, and I didn't hear the name. What was the name? Adele Rivero. And sometimes she's called Adele Rivero Belcher. Her first husband's last name was Rivero. Her second husband's last name was Belcher. So on her tombstone, which John Donaldson took a photograph of for me or found a photo of it. Uh, her name is Adele R. Belcher. And I want to shout out John Donaldson for his help and also another chess historian, John S. Hilbert, ha have oh, been yes. very helpful. And also uh, Graham Cree has posted the cross tables of every U.S. Women's Championship on his website and, and awesome. formatted them for inclusion in my book. So I'm, I'm oh. very grateful for team effort. Know, the UT Dallas help, but yeah, it, it's really the number of people that are coming out of the woodwork to help me with the book. I've had one of my, one former UT Dallas student, Todd Vitus Vidrikas, lives in Lithuania, and he put me in touch with Camille Begging Skate, who now lives yeah. in Lithuania. So, yeah. uh, you know, he tracked down her email address for me. Yeah, um, she was in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area for a while, but yeah. That's she right. She yeah. is. She won a, a Lithuanian Women's Championship, and it's really interesting uh -huh. in the book how many of the top women have also won championships in their home countries, uh, mm -hmm. either before or, in Camille's case, right. after winning the U.S. Right. Women's. Right. So. I do have I think, to say something about sure. your publisher because, yes. <clears throat> as I say, what's scrolling across the bottom of a screen right now is the URL for the dollar store and, that you can get quality products at inexpensive prices using mm -hmm. the discount code CHESS. That'll connect the business community with the chess community, and that's what we want to promote. But when to talk about quality, McFarland has got to be up there, if not number one as in terms of a quality chess book producer. What a great publishing, chess publishing uh, find it is. And to land them as your publisher is quite an accomplishment. I tip my hat to you because uh, I think they're the best. I love those books, whatever, whatever subject matter that they produce. I think it's always, um, and it's it's one of those books that you don't dog ear and you know or shove into the uh, into your uh, bookcase. Um, it's one of those things you want to take care of because it's so well produced. It's quality product. Well, so, I will pass that on to Robbie Franklin, and uh, mm -hmm. I need to shout out Andy Soltis because when uh -oh. I was looking around for a publisher, I I touched base with Andy and he gave me some tips for approaching Robbie Franklin. He said, don't bring up the Queen's Gambit when you're pitching this book idea. Uh -huh. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so Andy Soltis really connected me with Robbie Franklin, who is- Shout out to Andy Soltis. Yeah, yeah, who is, Franklin is the founder of McFarland and he's also the 
editor that works with the potential chess authors. And, you know, as I said, when I applied for the Arthur Award, I, I didn't know where my, my book would end up, but I'm, I'm delighted that it will be published by McFarland and Robbie's given me, along with Andy Soltis, have given me many helpful ideas. In fact, it was Robbie's idea to make it a games focused book because mm -hmm. you might be aware there's a book by Jennifer Shahade, Chess Bitch, Women in the Ultimate Intellectuals. I have it. Yeah, yeah. I have it too, autographed. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. Jennifer Shahadi's book was very interesting. It had a lot of uh, biographical and psychological and personal information about various women players, including U.S. women players like Rachel Crotto and Diane Severide. However, Shout out to it, Jen. Absolutely, yeah. And um, however, it was not games focused. There was some games in the back that weren't annotated. They were kind of just printed out and put in the back of the book. So uh, I wanted, you know, it's important when you write a book to not reproduce what's already been done. So when Robbie gave me a, the idea of making this a games focused book, I'm like, well, now that hasn't been done. Uh, Jennifer also has another book, Play Like a Girl, which has uh, positions yeah. from uh, women's chess games, but there are games from all over the world. And so again, my book, and you know this being an author, you want to differentiate your book. So my book is focused on U.S. women's champions, and you get to see the whole game annotated, not just a position. So, um, so, so the guidance has been spectacular. And I also want to mention not just Jennifer Shahade, but Almost every living U.S. women's champion has been in touch with me. I mean, I got in touch with them and they've been in touch with me and they have approved the games in their chapter or or even suggested games in their chapter. Uh -huh. uh, like Anna Zatonska said, she wants her win over Boris Gelfon to be in the chapter. And I'm like, well, OK, let's get that in the chapter. Okay. So yeah. uh, because I am including I want to show there's a there's a misconception that women only play women. So it is important in each chapter to show that these women players didn't just play in U.S. Women's Championships. They were top players playing against top male players, too. And so those games are also in their chapters. So luckily, fortunately, I have been in touch with almost every uh, living uh, U.S. Women's Chess Champion and getting their input on their chapters, which I think for me, it's fun to be in touch yeah. with them, but it also makes the book more special to know that their yeah. chapters are really a reflection of them. Yeah, and you know, I can remember um, uh, t talking to Susan Polgar, who is a former world woman's champion. And um, she, when she was growing up in Hungary, um, she was told that it was unnatural to play girls to play boys. And so you're just kind of knocking that horrible old stereotype down when you produce these games women playing against men it's perfectly natural there's nothing um to be uh, ashamed of uh nothing to be concerned about but um we have had and i always think that when you know in the chess world we've been, been about 20 to 30 years behind the times you know that we get women coming out in all sorts of jobs we have a woman vice president now uh, but the you know the male patriarchal domination of the chess governing bodies has always seemed to me to be lagging. Society is changing, but the chess society is a is being dragged uh, along with it, not willingly. Sometimes kicking and screaming. Have you run up against that, or am I, is that just my perception? Well. Interestingly enough, and I want to give a shout out to Ashley Yan, a high school student in Illinois. She and I are doing some research on ratings, comparing the ratings of the U.S. average rating of the U.S. Women's Championship compared to the average rating of the U.S. Championship over the years. But one thing that we're bringing out in our research is before 2000, less than 5% of USCF, that's the old name for United States Chess Federation. It used to be USCF, now it's US Chess. But anyway, less than 5% of USCF members were girls and women. Now, as of 2020, the percentage is fluctuating a little between 13 and 14%. So it's still not a huge amount. So with, with that, you know, people say, why aren't there more top women players? What's wrong with women? But uh, and Maureen Grimaud, who's uh, was quoted yes. in 
uh, New York Times, I believe, saying it's a numbers game. And I think she's right. And I think that there's more than that. There's been some studies about it. With so few women playing, you're going to naturally not have as many women at the top. It's it's just how numbers work. So That's that right. also is going to apply to get to your question, to chess governance. If there's so few women involved in playing chess, um, that means probably less become chess tournament directors, chess politicians, and so forth. So it's um, it's going to take more women playing in the Queen's Gambit, which I did actually ignore Sultis's advice a little and mention the Queen's Gambit <laughs> a little bit to Robbie Franklin in my in my query letter. That hey, the why, chess sets that, are flying out of the stores now. <laughs> well, so, yeah. that, that may be why it took you took me two months to actually get a contract. I don't know because then what <laughs> set me back, but. But, I, you know, the, the conventional wisdom is that the Queen's Gambit and the popularity of that yeah. may help bring more girls and women into chess. And I'm hearing that it's going to become a musical on Broadway. So my yeah, my new my that. new de, my new desire is for my book to be available at the same time that musical hits the stage because yeah. timing is everything. You know, well, because if you're interested in Beth Harmon, my book's about quote unquote, the real Beth Harmons, the actual women who were playing chess in the U.S. and at a high level. I mean, right. Irina Crush and Anna Zatonska at one point were both in the top 25 players in the country, male and female. So well, these once, are these I are once, good players. I once challenged Irina to a, to a match, but I was oh, backing okay. away when I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? I was edging out of the room and I said, I'll play you. I'll play you anytime. <laughs> Uh, well, she's she's an amazing oh, chess she's player. Way, such well, the, a good the, player. I was oh. I was a very uh, lucky woman because I played her in her first U.S. Women's Championship, which was in 1995 when she was 11. Not the first one she won. She won it at age 14 in 1998. But when she was 11, she was playing in her first ever U.S. Women's Championship, and we drew. And that's. Uh, the only game I've ever played. Get her. Them while so they're just, young. I could just sit on sit on that yeah. Uh, yeah. that draw. Uh, we haven't been paired since, but um, yeah, it's going to be a. I, I haven't yet selected the games for my chapter, but I'm yeah. going to have to look back at that draw and see if I could sneak that one in there. I, I got a draw against a former U.S. champion Joel Benjamin, and I bring it up every time I see him. <laughs> so, oh wow! Okay. No, I don't. I don't. I'm kidding. That's, I'm kidding. You know, but, that's, it, but congratulations, because he was he was <laughs> like Arena. He was also an amazingly strong player, even as a young person. Very young. So, very yeah. young. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, so you know, the, these types of things they do um, bring out the fact that yeah, there's no reason, but. Uh, that women can't excel at chess. Um, did you ever read Peggy Orenstein's book, Schoolgirls? I haven't just, read that one. I mean, yeah. Now I'll put it on my reading list, though. That sounds yeah. It was really interesting to me because I read it from the chess perspective, of course. But she was talking about women going into science and math and things like that. And they get to a certain age where the opinion of boys start to matter. And the boys are always teasing them and trying to peer pressure them out of those fields. And I think the same thing kind of happens in, in chess. But if you have more girls around that age, um, then that peer pressure will fade and they will be able to support each other. And then they will, be, if, they, if they want to, continue to excel. Um, because I know I used to move around quite a bit before I, I got settled. And um, you walk into a chess club, it's not a friendly place to walk into. It's just, you know, they don't ask you what's your name. They ask you what's your rating. So, you know, it's an intimidating place to visit when you're unknown. Um, so, you know, I think that we have, we're seeing it develop right before our eyes where there are enough women around to support each other so they don't feel like the odd person in the room right. anymore. Right. But you I must mean, have you must have experienced. Yeah, that. I mean, I was usually the only girl playing in, in right. tournaments, and uh, I mean, the most outrageous story about that was uh, there was a tournament uh, that the Tacoma Chess Club had scheduled to play in a gymnasium. Well, it turned out the gymnasium was being used for something else, so they rescheduled the tournament for the men's locker room, and so I played 
the tournament in the men's locker room, which was was set up with tables, but it was being used as a men's locker room. So that was not, as a teenage girl, that was not the most comfortable venue for me to play in. <laughs> so, I Looking mean, back, that's hysterical that uh, they would do that. Yeah, well, because, you know, they were, they thought they had booked the main floor, but it right, was busy, right. so they, you know. The best um, they could do, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, that was, that was probably way up on the list, but I mean, I've, I've written about this before, uh, that one common problem back in the old days was if you had a chess club with just one restroom and it was oh. designated, this was before unit, the idea of a unisex restroom was so popular. It was just designated as a men's restroom. And so I would have to sometimes go to an entirely different building you know, to, to find a restroom. So these yeah. are, I mean, this, it's, it sounds like a minor thing, but in terms of welcoming people, just, uh, and this is something uh, which I brought up and, and someone pointed out, well, this is how um, disabled people who don't have access to clubs and restrooms feel as well. It's, it's sure. a barrier. If you don't have a way to access basic functions like a restroom or even get in a building, if you're in a wheelchair, you know, these, these access issues and welcoming issues are really important. These are walls between us that don't need to be there. Oh, I think it's a, that. Yeah. I think it's, a, it's very important that we tear down the walls. And that's access. That's allowing people to just be like us. You know, just, just play. It doesn't matter what country you're from. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It shouldn't matter what you look like. And it shouldn't matter what gender you are. Chess is just... Uh, a universal language and it could be played by anyone anywhere. And so, you know, all these walls that we build between us, tear them down, you know, and if you don't want to pay attention to these things, the, the access for women, the access for disabled, um, you know, you just another brick in the wall. Yeah. So you know, I, I mean, orga down. Orga organizers will make the point though, that financially the places that they can afford may not be wheelchair accessible or may only have one restroom. So there's some real barriers financially to solving this problem. I mean, Very I'm true. sure that the Tacoma Chess Club would have liked to have had a place of where course. we weren't playing in a locker room, but that's well, that's of what course. we had. That's so the reality. It's, it's, it's interesting. And, and as we brought up before, wonderful sponsors like the St. Louis Chess Club, which of course their club is equipped with everything anyone right. would want. That makes such a difference in the experience of players, but it, it's it's still a it's still a challenge. What I what I've always been really excited about is the idea of chess in libraries because libraries are such wonderful buildings and they're correctly equipped for access and they're librarians are great people so i really love it when chess clubs can find homes in libraries and of course yes. you live near a city with the mechanics institute chess club which is in the same building as a, a library and uh what yes. an amazing facility that can is but you know in berkeley just around you know just over the bridge um i was talking with elizabeth shaughnessy and she she amazingly enough has created a building dedicated to chess mm -hmm. but the um ramp that was uh, the accessibility for the disabled was um uh damaged or just old and uh no longer was serviceable and the cost of putting in an elevator is staggering oh so no. even when you're aware and even mm -hmm. when you want right well that's things, what we were saying is the, the whole thing about organizers have you know, that, that problem that, you know, money doesn't grow on trees, unfortunately. So even if they want to yeah. have access or build, build an elevator or build a ramp. Yeah. But those yeah. are walls that we can't control, but the ones that we can't control, we should. And I think that we want to be, to be able to tear down the walls. Like, you know, don't think about access. Don't think about gender. Uh, these are things that we can't control. Now the facilities that we play in, that might be something that we, we just have to take what we could get. But well, and you know, that's the thing though, it's all connected and, and hopefully, yep. you know, there will be enough funds for, for chess clubs to be held in appropriate buildings that are accessible because, yep. you know, that is a barrier. But like you said though, um, on a personal level and certainly in the online environment, uh, we can just focus on being welcoming. And I think 
I think maybe online has advantages that way because people can do things from the comfort of their home. So it's an interest. It's an interesting time that we're living in for sure. Yes. Yes. And um, you know, is there anything that before I get gonged, my producers relentless. Um, yes, right. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you want to talk about? I think we've we've covered a lot. We've covered University of Texas at Dallas. We've covered the Arthur Award and how that's going to help me with my forthcoming book, United States Women's Chess Champions, published by McFarland. Uh, it really will make a difference to have some money to, to track down those last few score sheets that just aren't easily available. And uh, I think I've, I've tried to shout out some of the many people that have already contributed to this this book project and um so and you certainly uh head the list and are in the acknowledgments and thank yous because your yeah. your foundation supporting this really makes a difference because mcfarland is a wonderful publisher but like many academic publishers it doesn't give an advance uh on the book so it's all all research and efforts are out of pocket for me um yeah. to hopefully be somewhat compensated down the road by royalties, but that's really nothing that you can ever count on. And so, no. yeah, so it really makes no. a difference. So thank you. Yeah. As, as a, uh, someone who's, who's tried to, to do the writing up front and, and hope to get paid later, you know, I, it's, it's gotta be a labor of love. You got just want to really want to do it. So yeah. And, and it, it give is. Give the hat to you, Alexi. <laughs> You're doing a great job. You've been doing a great job for a long time. Very proud of you. And I want to help support you in the future if I can. But right now, I've got to, I, I, my producer is yes. just telling me we've got to end the show. All right. Thank um, you. So I, I will see you. I will see. I'll take you backstage okay. now. Sounds good. <clears throat> and I will wrap up by saying this has been the uh, Eve Foundation's The Chess Files. The answers are out there. And the Eve Foundation is dedicated to building communities through chess. And if you're part of a community, you never have to feel alone. And we're using our sponsor, the dollar store. Use the discount code CHESS. It's this dollar store. There's lots of dollar stores out there. Go to, go to the one that's FBDS, dollar store. And you will find quality products at inexpensive prices. Using the discount code CHESS, you will connect the business community with the CHESS community. And that's what we're all about at the Eid Foundation. Now, I'm going to say goodbye to you, but it's 1 p.m. Eastern time every Friday. And we'll see you then.